Hello. Welcome to our program entitled Integrating Insulin Biosimilars into Clinical Practice, New Pathways and New Challenges. Your faculty today is myself, Dr. Ann Peters. I'm the Director of the Clinical Diabetes Program and Professor of Clinical Medicine at the Keck School of Medicine of the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, California. The other speaker is Susan Cornell, who's the Associate Director, Office of Experiential Education, Associate Professor, Pharmacy Practice, Midwestern University, Chicago College of Pharmacy, Downers Grove, Illinois, and Certified Diabetes Care and Education Specialist, Bolingbrook Christian Health Clinic, Bolingbrook, Illinois. I'm going to start first, and the first thing we're going to go through is the basic program information. This is approved for one CME, CNE, CPE, and AAPE credit. You can download a PDF of the presentation under the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen under the headshots. If you have a question throughout the program, please type it in the box located in the lower left of your screen. All questions will be answered the last 10 minutes of the presentation. You will be redirected back to the landing page after the webinar to complete the post-test and evaluation. You can then download or print your CME certificate. The program is provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, LLC, and HMP Company. This program is supported by an educational grant from Sandoz, Inc., a Novartis division. The learning objectives from this program are to review the biosimilar regulatory review process, the characteristics of biosimilars as compared to their reference products, and the most recent safety, efficacy, and switching data for existing biosimilars. We're going to discuss considerations specific to the potential production of insulin biosimilars. We're going to describe interchangeability definitions and clinical implications for insulin biosimilar interchangeability. And we're going to discuss strategies for integrating these products into clinical care for shared decision-making and making effective patient education programs regarding biosimilars. Now, to start with, when you look at the term biosimilar, that's something that I think we're all more or less familiar with. But it turns out by a quirk of the regulatory pathway, insulin isn't at this very second a biosimilar, but it's what's considered a follow-on biologic. And you're going to have to bear with me a bit as we go through this because it's complicated, but the fundamental point is that these insulins are similar to the insulins we're used to using, and we just need to figure out how to integrate them into our practice and our patient's care. Now, in terms of the rationale for biosimilars, why do we have them at all? Well, first of all, we're all used to the concept of generic medications. And the notion of a generic is obviously that it costs less, Therefore, there's increased availability if it's more widely available on formularies and it's less expensive for patients. And then when you make a biosimilar, you actually make a different device that goes with it. So each company that makes a biosimilar insulin can make their own device for using it. So it allows you the benefit of making different devices, but it also then causes some degree of uh, patients not quite believing that it's the same insulin when it comes in a different device. So you're going to hear more about this later as we get patients used to these insulins that are very similar, if not identical, to what they're used to, but perhaps coming in the form of a different device. Now, we know that there's a huge cost to insulin, and I'm going to show you slides about how the cost of insulin has gone up. But if you look at the two the 2017 healthcare expenditures on insulin alone for people with diabetes, the total costs were approximately $15 billion. Now, this is just for insulin, and we know that there are lots of other costs for patients with diabetes, the oral and other injectable medications, complications, hospitalizations, ER visits, the whole gamut of things that cost a lot of money for our patients. And the key 
is to try to provide patients with products they can use, they can afford, and frankly, that we can adjust in order to prevent the complications of diabetes and help our patients live long and healthy lives. Earl Hirsch, who's a very good friend of mine, has been really outspoken about the concern over the costs of insulin. And this is just a reference to one of many of his articles discussing the cost of insulin in America and really whether or not people with diabetes, all people with diabetes who need insulin should have it or not. And I think this is an important area in which there's been a lot of uh, notice. They've noticed it in Congress and the pharmaceutical companies have been working to try to make it easier and cheaper for our patients to get insulin. But this is what Dr. Hirsch has been talking about. And this is a graph which on the x-axis shows you the year and on the y-axis looks at the cost per one ml, 100 units of insulin. And what you see is that for a long time, the costs were pretty flat. And then starting in about 2001, you start seeing this marked increase in basically the cost of all kinds of insulin. And this is an increase that's greater than the cost for other medications. So insulin disproportionate to other treatments has gone way up in cost. And this slide looks at the same sort of graph, but it looks at the cost of patented versus off-patent insulin. So in a way, this looks at the cost of drugs that are still not being prepared as biosimilars or follow-on biologics versus those that are. So there's clearly a cost savings in terms of using medications that are off-patent insulin. Some of these off-patent insulins are the older ones, like NPH and regular, that we used before we had the analog class and, frankly, that are still used today in many different settings. If you look at the cost of diabetes management, and this is now all management, and this is the monthly average out-of-pocket cost for patients in the United States, it's pretty high. It's $360 per month per patient, and that's a lot of money for many of my patients, my older patients who are on fixed incomes, my college students, my young adults who are trying to start a family and figure out how to pay for the basic necessities of life. And that's a lot more money than it is in many countries around the world. So cost is a very significant issue in this country. Now, when insulin costs too much, and this is a very recent article, what they found is that patients don't use as much as they should. And so basically patients are skimping on the doses of insulin they give. And they're doing this to save money. So instead of giving 50 units a day, they may be giving 25 units a day, knowing that obviously this doubles the amount of time that one vial of insulin or one pen will last. And when they do this, obviously it's associated with poor glycemic outcomes. So skimping on insulin, underusing insulin to save money is a very bad practice and it ends up resulting in serious complications down the line. Now, a lot of patients, as it turns out, are embarrassed to tell their healthcare provider that they're skimping on their insulin. And it's important to ask this. If a patient comes into your office, maybe they seem to be out of control, a really good question is, A, are you giving the doses recommended or what doses are you giving? And if it seems significantly less than prescribed, then one of the reasons why could be this cost issue. There are patients I've had who share their insulin with a family member. There are all sorts of reasons to skimp, to underuse insulin, and we need to make sure that patients aren't doing this. Now, as I said, there's real-world consequences. So I talked about skimping on insulin or rationing insulin. There's people who travel abroad to get insulin, people who live in the Pacific Northwest often go to Canada in order to purchase it. I've had patients who've had their insulin come from all over the world just because they can afford it more readily. Um, patients can have higher A1Cs and more complications, as I discussed. And finally, in patients who have to ration insulin, there's a higher risk of DKA and in some cases, death. And I do see patients where I work in East Los Angeles where once or twice a year, I will hear of an individual, a young person who just couldn't afford their insulin, went into DKA and died. So 
this is something that's very serious and it's healthcare providers we need to consider and really work for it starting with just the safety net so patients can get insulin so they survive and then beyond that obviously to have good glycemic control. Now all of us want truly inexpensive insulin for our patients and there's been this promise of generic insulin. Well, it turns out that you can't really make a generic insulin like you can for other medications because it's a much more complex process to make insulin than some of the simpler pills that you can just kind of concoct up in a laboratory and, and put on the market. So the notion of truly generic insulin isn't a real one, but less expensive insulin and these biosimilar insulins is real. So I'm going to talk about some things that I think are kind of boring, if you want to say the truth, but they're real in terms of understanding this process. And so we know that the patent protection has expired for a number of the insulins that we use commonly, like Glargine and Lyspro. And we know that there are many other patent protections that will expire in the near future. So we're going to be able to use these biosimilars in clinical practice. But as we're going to discuss the development, manufacturing, and approval, the basic cost of creating these similar products, these similar versions of biologic projects are much more complicated than for generic versions. I'm going to talk about the biosimilar pathways because even though this is complicated, it kind of begins to make this make some sense. And there are reasons for this, that the pathways are more complicated, but it's useful to hope, at least, that we can make this process more simple. Now, historically, biological drugs are made from living cells or organisms, and they're using recombinant DNA technology. This has been a real boon to our ability to treat many different diseases. And the actual first biopharmaceutical introduced into clinical use was insulin. It was recombinant human insulin, which was introduced in 1982. And since then, we know of many, many more biopharmaceuticals, peptide hormones, hematopoietic and non-hematopoietic growth factors, interferon, interleukons, monoclonal antibodies. All of these are now being used commonly. And I think we're all used to these agents now. They're not new, um, but they're more complicated than some of the drugs we've used traditionally. So small molecules, small molecule generic drugs can be easily manufactured. You just take the referent drug's chemical formula and active pharmaceutical ingredients, mix it together, and you can meet the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic bioequivalence requirements. It's like, you know, a chemistry in the lab, you mix it together, you get the right stuff, and you prove that it's the same. But the biological drugs are huge in comparison, and they're produced in living cells or organisms. So you can't just stick chemicals together and get these drugs. You have to go through a process of proving you can make them that are truly the same as the non-generic or the original parent compound. And you don't always get the same product. So you really want to be sure that what you're doing is selling now a product that is similar in all ways and that will work the same and that also has the same stability. And there are all sorts of factors that affect stability of these medications. So you want it to act a lot like the parent compound. And this is a slide that shows you the differences between generics and biosimilars. So generics are small and stable. Biosimilars are large proteins. They're complicated and they're susceptible to environmental conditions, light, heat, agitation, whatever, changing the way they act. In terms of manufacturing, generics are a chemical synthesis process. Biosimilars are recombinant DNA made in living cells. To develop and validate these for generics, again, it's pretty simple. You have to do bioequivalent studies, and these are simple analytic methods. For biosimilars, you have to do a lot more research. You have to use very specialized analytic methods, and you have to really prove that in living human beings, these are similar to what you're trying to copy. 
The generics generally tend to be oral. Biosimilars are by and large injected, um, but not always. Now, this is just a slide discussing the ways that there can be variability. And I don't know that I need to go through all of these, but I think that it's just important to think about that the process of creating these, storing these, growing these, harvesting these is all very different than when you make a routine generic drug. Then there's the whole concept of interchangeability. And this is slightly mind boggling to me, but it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. So when you and I prescribe a medication to a patient and it's a generic drug, um, a traditional generic, it's possible that a pharmacist can interchange a generic for non-generic. That's a pretty simple switch. We all know that happens with our patients, that it's done routinely, it lowers costs, and it's a good thing. But interchangeability of biosimilars is something, in a way, that has to be proven, and it's not as easy. So we talked in terms of this table about these complicated biological pro products we talk about biosimilar, meaning a biological product that is highly similar to and has no clinically significant differences from an existing FDA-approved product. And I'm going to talk about the approval pathways. But an interchangeable product has to meet an even higher standard. And so there is further evidence that a compound has to meet to be interchangeable. So really you have to prove that in a human, you're going to have the same clinical result as the reference product and that the safety and efficacy of going back and forth between the products is equal. So if I put you on glargine that's branded versus glargine that's a biosimilar, the going back and forth doesn't change your clinical state. And obviously that matters a lot with insulin because if you give 50 units of one thing, you want it to be acting the same as 50 units of the other thing. And so interchangeable, that designation is something that frankly makes my life easier because then at the pharmacy, someone can just get a medication for insulin at the lowest price. But at the moment, we actually have to write what we mean. Do you mean this one or that one? Do you mean Basaglar or do you mean Lantus? Because they're not going to be interchanged at this point, even though they're both glargine. Follow-on products are copies of biologic products that go under a specific um, pathway, the 505B2 pathway. And I'll talk about that more. There's a reference product, which is the thing you're trying to copy, and then the originator product, which are not terms I think we really need to discuss much. But in terms of the pathways, it turns out that I think when all of these compounds were started, there was a way, a pathway that was developed. And this was developed so that biosimilar medications can be copied. And they call this a 505 pathway, and then they modified it to be the 505B2. And they basically wanted to do this so that the process was similar. Um, but what happens is, is that they also created another act and another pathway. And so they then had two pathways. One is section 351, and one is section 505. And insulin and other biologic compounds fit in the 505, others 351. And again, you don't really need to know this exactly, but what you do need to know is that the whole point of this process is to safely and effectively mimic the original compound and to do it in a way that provides patient safety but doesn't become prohibitively expensive, meaning doing all new clinical trials and one of the things that the FDA is trying to reconcile is can they pull in data from the parent compound to then use it to approve the biosimilar compound. So they finally have pulled all these pathways together and this year we now have a new pathway or actually a modification of an old pathway 
that all biosimilars are going to follow. So as of now, you're not going to really need to know about these old different pathways, but it's been important in the development of these compounds. And I think it's all because this is new. We haven't really had patents. These drugs go off patent so that we haven't really had a lot of need for doing this. But as this becomes more and more common, it's been important to really standardize the process through which these drugs become approved. So this is the old pathway, and this is the one that insulin biosimilars have followed. And again, you don't need to know all the details of this except the point about safety, but also the point about trying to draw in information from the parent compound to look at the safety and efficacy and to make it so that it's not exorbitantly expensive to make biosimilars. So when they've been getting approval, and this is the older pathway, but it's still similar to what we're doing now, you first have to show that the protein that you've made is similar when you do the basic chemical characterization of the drug. So you want to make sure it's the same protein, it looks the same in all sorts of regards. It's very similar to the parent compound. Then you look at a biological characterization, you do bioassays, all of the kinds of things um, that you would do to make sure that it, it works appropriately. And then they go into preclinical clinical studies and then clinical trials. And again, this is an abbreviated pathway, so it's not the same as bringing a new compound to market, but it is a pathway that involves study and testing and making sure that the biosimilar works well in human beings and is something that we can all use safely. So when we get to the clinical side to all of this, what I want to know is what is the FDA really telling me? Is a biosimilar really exactly the same as what my patients have been using before? And therefore, is it substitutable? Do I have to worry if I switch from A to B? Is it exchangeable? What does this mean to me as I do this clinically? And then I want to know what to tell patients, what to expect, if anything, because I don't want people to have an adverse reaction, particularly not hypoglycemia or, frankly, hyperglycemia, because I've switched them to a different form of insulin, a different way of making the insulin that I'm used to. Now, I discussed interchangeability, and that's also part of this. Um, and as I said, I would really want insulins to become interchangeable. And the bottom bullet basically states what I'm talking about. If it's truly interchangeable, it's substitutable by a pharmacist without me doing anything, without me having to write a separate pre prescription for this thing because this is what the patient has on their formulary versus that thing. Um, I want insulin to be insulin and I want to specify the type, but within that I would love it to be something that would be interchangeable or substitutable. So I'm going to go through the products that we currently have and I think are fairly used to using. So we have follow-on insulin glargine. And obviously, these products are developed for financial reasons, but I think that's a good reason given how expensive um, some of these agents have been. The challenges are obviously to make sure that this is the same in our patients, and I do believe that follow-on insulin glargine has been when I've switched it um, in my patients. And in terms of availability, it only comes in a pen. It does not come in vials. And the pen is a different pen than our patients are using for their glargine when they use the branded form. So it requires perhaps a little bit of commentary. You're going to hear more about this later in terms of how you get patients to understand that the pen may be different, but the stuff inside is the same. Um, but the big difference to me is honestly that it doesn't come in vials because I do have old school patients who just like vials no matter what. Um, but otherwise it comes in a pen, it comes in the same units, and I think is, at least in my clinical experience, pretty much interchangeable. And again, I have to write specifically if I'm giving somebody this as opposed to the branded form, but I obviously am comfortable doing that. 
This shows the data that looks at the PKPD, and you can see in non-diabetic humans, if you compare the branded to the non-branded, this is the, the biosimilar versus the parent compound, very similar in terms of the PK, the PK and in type 1s. This is just an example of looking at the PD, and you can see, again, almost identical in terms of how they act. Now, where I put this in my treatment paradigm, I'm always interested in an individual in terms of cost. Um, so if a patient has insurance, I obviously want to give them the option that is best for them, that has the lowest copay. And so, frankly, formularies tell me what to do. And for some formularies, it's one, and for another, it's a different one. But I'm always willing to um, work with patients to try to find the best for them in terms of their paying for it. If a pa patient's paying cash, there are actually a lot of programs now for patients who don't have enough money to pay for their insulin. So you can look at the individual companies and they may have a program that lets your patient get some of these insulins for a lot less money if they're paying cash. So I would definitely have patients look into those patient assistance programs. Um, and again, I think it's important just to let patients know it's different, but it should act similarly and make sure patients know to let you know if there's any problem. We now have a rapid-acting insulin that's a biosimilar, and this is Insulin Lice Pro, which is called Admalog, and it actually comes as a pen and as a vial, um, and very much like with the GLAR gene, if you do the PKPD studies, you see that it's very similar in terms of how it acts. And when I've switched patients from one to the other, I personally haven't seen clinical differences. So I'm comfortable um, switching patients from one to the other. This just came out last year. Um, and it is less expensive, but again, if patients are buying this not through their insurance, not as a covered benefit, but they're buying it cash. They can look into patient assistance programs or look through some of these programs that help price different medications at different pharmacies because we really want to get patients to be on the insulin they need and not have to ration insulin, um, which is a very important goal. This slide is only slightly confusing because it talks about the fact that one of the companies, Lilly, announced something that they call generic insulin lice pro. And instead of making a biosimilar, so if you're going to make a biosimilar to a Lilly product, you're going to be a whole different company. But what Lilly did is they took their own insulin, the same lice pro that they've always made, and now they've called a subset of it generic. And that's allowed them to list it at a 50% lower price so that patients who are buying this over the counter can get it for less. And this only, in a way, is it's a good thing and it's a confusing thing because this isn't a biosimilar. This is just Lily making their own insulin and calling it a generic. Um, but suffice it to say, it's all about finding out what's the best for your patient and what they can afford. So I looked in a program called GoodRx, which is an online app, and there are a number of these. This is one that I use commonly. And I looked at the cost of various insulins. And what you see is how much it can vary. So if you look at Insulin Lice Pro Generic, you can get a bottle of insulin for $68, and that's the cheapest I could find. If you look at a branded version of it, it's $172, and if you look at a brand of the follow-on biologic, it's $144. So this really says that if you help patients do their homework and look at the difference in cost, they may be able to do a lot better than they think. So if they go to their pharmacy and suddenly they have to pay $300, you might want to help them or at least advise them to look at these different ways of um, paying for it because there are all sorts of different prices out there. So it's not the same as it used to be. And now there's another additional 
layer of the pharmaceutical companies giving out these medications at lower prices as part of a program. So it's a confusing world, but it's also a world that I think allows us to really help our patients with the goal of, first of all, helping them understand that the biosimilar process is a very rigorous one, that these insulins are in fact very similar to the insulins that they're used to, the branded form, and you can comfort them and talk to them in that way, and then make sure that once you switch a patient, you let them know that there are any issues with it, that obviously to let you know, and that finally you really can shop around for the cost of these, and you can make it more affordable, and there are increasing ways to do this. Um, so hopefully I've made some sense out of a very confusing area, but I think it's becoming easier. I think with having only one regulatory pathway, it's easier. And I think we're all getting more used to this um, in terms of our options for patients. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Susan to discuss the next part of our talk. Well, thank you, Dr. Peters. I appreciate uh, the introduction, and hopefully folks took away some valuable pearls, a lot of great information that you presented. Uh, and so I'm going to start out my section with actually a story. Uh, so as a pharmacist, and I've worked in various practices in, in the course of my career, and one day I was working in the community pharmacy, and the patient came in to pick up an antibiotic, uh, that was prescribed and went over all the counseling points with her and she left and she called maybe about two hours later and she was very upset and I said well what's wrong she said well the medicine isn't working and I said well you know tell me what happened how did you take it well she took one dose of an antibiotic and she expected instantly to feel better uh, you know so completely forgot everything that her physician who prescribed the antibiotic told her, as well as what me, as the pharmacist, told her. And so, uh, you know, the problem or the point of this is, is that patients need to be educated and understand what to expect from their medications. So medicines don't work in people who don't take them, and they don't work in people that don't take them correctly. So you know, we have to spend the time educating the patient, just like we educate each other about changes within the system and um, you know the healthcare system. So we're all familiar with the adherence problem or non-adherence problem, I should say. You know, Dr. Peters presented the fact and how patients are skimping on their insulin or they're stretching their doses. You know, I have several patients I work with who take statins and they do every other day uh, to again stretch their doses. So people get very creative in taking their medication when they don't have access to it or the quantity or the supply is, is very small. It, but when we talk about diabetes, if we look at medication non-adherence specifically to diabetes therapies, there is a lot of room for improvement. And we think about how medications, as well as lifestyle, really help to manage diabetes. And if the patient doesn't understand this, again, they can't manage their diabetes. You know, we blame them, but really it is a team-based effort. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about here in our moments together. So, you know, the problem or the consequence, of course, is lack of control, of diabetes control, but it also puts a burden on the healthcare system because now we're starting to see increases not only in physician visits, but urgent care or emergency room, more hospitalizations, more complications, and all of this is just because the patient isn't taking the medication or they're not taking it correctly. So we really have to start screening for adherence. You know, we do a lot of checkbox medicine, which I understand, you know, we're all doing today. You know, we're screening for depression. <clears throat> we're screening for domestic violence. Uh, elder abuse, smoking cessation, but are we screening for adherence? And that is something that needs to be done. And again, this is the pharmacist's role within the team-based care. So one of the things we do at our clinic, and this has been proven um, as a you know valuable way to assess adherence, we ask our patients several questions. So in terms of their medication, you know, what are they taking the medicine for? 
how many times people don't even know why they're taking a certain medication or they misunderstand it. Uh, you know, how many people I've run into who are on a statin and when you say, well, what is this for? Oh, it's to protect my heart. Well, true, that is true, but it's also to lower the cholesterol. And if you ask them, are you on a cholesterol medicine? No, I'm not on a cholesterol medicine. I'm on a heart medicine. But that's, again, their interpretation. So making sure we are understanding where the patient is coming from. How are they taking it? And that's the big one. Because if they're not taking it correctly, they're going to give subtle clues. Well, I'm supposed to do this, or I usually do that. And those are subtle clues that say, hey, something's not right here. And then asking them to, what problems have they had since they've started the medication? What side effects are they worried about? What about costs? And then when do they skip a dose or miss a dose? And as you notice, these are all open-ended questions that get, as I like to call it, get the gossip so that we know what our patients are doing and are they doing everything correctly or is there room for improvement. And as we saw from the statistics, there's room for improvement. So one of the things we want to look at in terms of improving adherence is what are the patient's expectations? What, so my lady with the antibiotics, she was expecting to take one pill and boom, feel better. That doesn't happen. And again, my fault. I blame myself for not telling her, you probably won't feel a difference for a few days. You need to take this regularly as prescribed for, you know, for its entire duration. So again, lack of education, and that was my fault, by not explaining it to her, made her think that she takes one pill and she's better. So what is the patient expectation? Giving them that education and information they need. You know, the other thing is this is a team-based condition. Many conditions today we have to work as a team. So that's where we have to get to know who else is involved and create a plan that works for our patients. The ADA every year puts out their um, medical standards of care for people with diabetes and of course just came out a few weeks ago and they are very, very persistent in saying that it's a patient-centered collaborative care practice. So we need to actively listen to what the patient is saying and recognizing their understanding might be very different than what we're trying to say. You know, they may have beliefs, they may have literacy or numeracy issues, they may have barriers to care. Cost is one of the biggest barriers. So again, it is a team approach and the decision cycle that the ADA has uh, published talks about not only you know, assessing the patient, but then this continual follow-up of care. We can prescribe any medication, but if there's no follow-up or the patient is lost in the follow-up, again, that's where we see not only adherence issues, but we see, you know, control, diabetes management issues. So what are some of the barriers? I mean, if we think about it, insulin itself tends to be a barrier. I like to call it the, uh, the psychological insulin resistance. My brother-in-law, love him to death. You know, he has diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and he's at a point where I really do believe he's, he needs insulin. He's doing well, but there's room for improvement. Uh, and I'll be honest, you know, in this case, you know, he could even use a non-insulin injectable. He is just afraid of needles. He does not like needles. He doesn't want to do it, uh, any type of injection, be it once a day or once a week. And so there's that barrier there. Now, of course, being a brother-in-law family member, you know, I'm limited. I can't really talk to him as much because he's going to shut me off really quick. But there are many patients we deal with, and if we don't spend the time educating them, uh, you'll find that, you know, they're resistant to taking insulin. So I don't want to confuse it with true insulin resistance, but this is the psychological insulin resistance. But you know what in, is interesting is a lot of providers also have that psychological insulin resistance. Oh, you know, we still have other oral agents to try. We don't need to go to an injectable. And so this is where, again, education is critical and overcoming the barriers to the psychological insulin resistance in and it itself is a barrier, let alone talking about a biosimilar. So one of the ways to you know, overcome barri uh, barriers to injectable medication is to use motivational 
interviewing skills and talking to patients about, you know, what is it about injectables that have them concerned? You know, I like to say to the patients, what, what is it about an injectable medication that you're worried about? Would you be willing to try an injectable medication here right now? And oftentimes people are afraid of the needle. And when they see the small needles, especially those with pen needles today, they're very surprised. And when they feel the pen needle, be it with a dry injection or an actual injection, they really are surprised at how it doesn't hurt. I didn't even notice it. So you know, one of the things we often do, especially with long-acting basal insulins, is do the first dose in the office. So it allows us not only, one, to make sure the patient's technique is appropriate, but two, it eases their fear because somebody's there with them doing that particular insulin dose. So again, having that conversation, um, what have they heard about insulin? You know, would, what would it take for them to consider using it? So looking at the patient and involving them in the decision-making process. So very quickly here, the next few slides are more about making sure that the patient is ready for an injectable, and in this case, insulin. So do they have all of the supplies that they need? When we're prescribing insulin, be it a vial, we need to make sure there are syringes also prescribed. When we're prescribing pens, we need to make sure pen needles are supplied. I mean, how many times I see it all the time where insulin is prescribed, but the device to deliver it is not, be it a syringe or a pen needle. And the patient goes home and they think it's wonderful because they never actually inject it. You know, do they have blood glucose monitoring supplies, of course, glucagon, and do they have a referral or a contact list so that they know who to follow up with if something goes wrong. The other big thing we have to spend time is showing them not only how to use it, but how to store it appropriately. And again, a very quick table for you to review, but remembering that insulin needs to be stored in the refrigerator until it's open. Once it's open, then it becomes spoilable. So we have to make sure that once opened, we don't use it past the expiration date. And I'll tell you, people get confused on this. I had a patient, a gentleman in clinic recently, who was on a vial and syringe and was switched to a biologic uh, insulin, and he actually you know, had never used a pen before. So he went two weeks without any insulin because no one ever showed him how to use a pen. So he was waiting until he can come talk to me to see how to use the pen. In the meantime, two weeks, no insulin. Of course, his blood sugar was well over 400. But beside that point, he was storing the insulin on top of his refrigerator. So it wasn't even stored in the refrigerator. It was on top of the refrigerator. So again, these are things we need to make sure the patient knows how to do. And then going through the technique with them checking that the pen is appropriate, attaching the needle, uh, doing the prime two-unit or three-unit prime shot as needed, and then dialing up their regular dose. You know, so many times patients don't prime the needle, and so they're not getting their full dose. So we want to make sure they do their two-unit air shot, as we, we call it, then they dial up the regular dose, that the area they're injecting is clean, they're going straight in, 90 degree angle. And if they're using some of the shorter needles, they don't need to pinch. They really don't need to pinch. So unless they're really, really skinny, uh, a lot of the patients I deal with are not really, really skinny. So you know they can just put the needle straight in and then depress the button and hold it there, hold the needle in place for, I like to say, 10 seconds. Because if we say 10, we'll probably get five. And then teaching them how to remove the needle, you know, dispose of it properly, and then make sure they're changing the location of their injection site. I don't like to use the word rotate because I've had patients who put the needle in and rotate it around, and then they complain how much it hurts. So we don't like to say rotate. We like to say change the location of your injection site, and then we give them kind of areas for how they can inject. Now, in terms of biologics, and this is more looking at some studies that were on non-insulin biologics, there are barriers. You know, Dr. Peters nicely covered about the fact we don't know a lot about them sometimes, or there's a fear of not knowing. I don't know enough about it, so I just won't use it. And 
there's a lack of confidence that comes with many of these products. And that confidence, if we don't have it as the healthcare professional, that's going to convey over to the patient. And the patient's not going to take it if they feel or sense that we're not comfortable with it. So that's one of the other things we have to look for. Not to mention, as I like to, you know, I love the term, the nocebo effect. You know, how many times we have this negative viewpoint of things that, again, we're not certain of, you know, and of course, nocebo meaning to harm. So we think that these drugs, because they're not the real thing, are going to be harmful. So this is where, going back to where we started, that education is critical. Making sure the patient, as well as providers, other healthcare professionals, that we understand that these drugs are tested. They're tried and true, and they're tested. And so we have to bring the patient, as well as the team in, to the decision making so that they understand the value in the biologics. Now, with that, the other thing we want to think about, too, is looking at who's the patient. You know, I hear from many of my patients, the gentleman who didn't take his insulin for two weeks, part of it was he was very furious because some, you know, his insurance switched him. The pharmacy that he went to, they just changed him. Nobody told him anything. It was just like, oh, you can no longer get the vial and syringe. Boom. Here's these pen devices and pen needles. Thank goodness they gave him the needles. But they sent him on his way. And they didn't explain anything. So he was furious. He's like, I was doing fine, and now, you know, somebody's telling me I've got to change my medicine. So he was very upset about that. So this is where, again, information, explaining what's happening to him can actually make a difference. And if you look at patient concerns in terms of biosimilars, you know, they're worried that these drugs are not going to be as effective that they might have problems with it. You know, they're not familiar. It's not going to work as good as the other medication or the real medication. So we have to be able to uh, disprove that. So educating the patients, making sure that they understand, getting their buy-in, educating all of the other providers, as I've already previously mentioned. But one of the things is we have to be on the same page as the patient. And not everybody is as quick to jump on the biosimilar train as others. So it's not a one-size-fits-all. We have to basically take our time and individualize the approach. Because, you know, I just go back to my patient who was switched on. He didn't know why. He was furious about it. No one showed him how to use the uh, pen device. And so he went for two weeks without insulin. Just think about how devastating that could have been if he continued on that pathway. So this is where, again, we have to take our time, don't rush into the process, and make sure that the patient agrees to this and, ha and they have a choice in the matter. A big concern, too, is when people are doing fine and why are you changing me? And oftentimes it does have to do with the cost. But again, they need to understand that and they need to be informed of the decisions that are changing. You know, they, because then they may have that nocebo effect where, well, I was doing fine when I was on the other insulin. If I switch to this, I'm going to have problems with it. And that perception alone can cause stress, which of course can increase our blood glucose levels. So, you know, again, this is where making sure that the patients do have a say-so in the matter. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for their time today. You know, just kind of in summary and conclusion today, we're coming a long way with biosimilars, and I think it is the, the future of diabetes management, and we have to make sure that we're educating not only our healthcare professionals and our colleagues, but our patients, because again, that nocebo effect does have a negative effect on patients, and if they don't buy into it, the chances of them managing their diabetes is just not going to happen. So with that, what I'd like to do is now turn it over for questions and answers. I know at the beginning, uh, Dr. Peters went through how to submit a question and answer. So at this time, if you haven't already done so, let's go ahead and do that. And I'm going to uh, turn it back for Q&A. Dr. Peters, I'm going to send the first one to you. Uh, do you have any patients who seem to have a negative reaction 
to any of the biosimilar insulins. So it depends on how you define negative reaction. So I have patients who've been on the kind of insulin that isn't a, a branded insulin for a really long time, and they're very comfortable with it, and they're a little bit leery of changing. And I understand that. Nobody likes change, and your body is your body, and you're injecting something into it. So I'll go through with them how similar these insulins are and why I think there shouldn't be a difference, and then sort of deal with the psychological negative reaction. And most of the time, people will try the biosimilar and do fine, and they won't worry about it. But a certain amount of education helps. In terms of a true... Uh, physiologic different reaction, I've never seen it. So I really believe that you can switch them, but the big negative reactions, more the patient's concerns and fears, and just working through it with them. And, you know, people can pay more if they want the branded form, but that's, you know, most of the time it's okay to get the biosimilar. Um, and I haven't, like I said, in the end, had an issue at all that I thought was, you know, medically different between the different compounds. And I would agree with that, uh, you know, because if you think about it, oftentimes with um, formularies, patients are switched from insulins all the time. And I'm sure you as well as I have seen when patients are on one particular insulin, and it could be a brand name insulin, they may have a reaction. You know, one common thing that I've heard and seen in many of our um, list serves uh, for diabetes educators is the fact that, you know, sometimes you'll get like a lip swelling or a rash from some of the analogs. Um, so, you know, it can happen with one but not another. So I agree it's not necessarily um, with the biosimilar or the biologic. It's more of just a particular insulin and a person's reaction to that. So a couple other questions coming in here, and I know you kind of did cover this, Dr. Peters, but um, it might be good to uh, refresh everyone. Does a physician need to approve the switch to biosimilars? The answer to that question is yes. A physician or nurse practitioner, whoever has the license to prescribe, needs to do it at this moment, which kind of makes me slightly nuts sometimes because I can't always tell what's on someone's formulary. And if I write for one that's branded and then that's not on the formulary, then it gets kicked back and I have to rewrite the whole prescription and the patient's waiting. So I personally wish that the switch could occur at the level of the getting it from the pharmacy, but at the moment that doesn't happen. So we actually have to write specifically for what we, we want. And, it, you know, like I said, you've got to know what's on the patient's formulary. So that can be sort of troublesome sometimes. Yeah, and, you know, I, I completely agree. You get the red light flashing sometimes when you try to order it, uh, you know, on the uh, on the Epic or whatever software system you're using, and it's, it's a game of hit or miss sometimes. Um, so also on that, a good question that came in, why were insulins categorized follow-on biologics for the past few years, and now they're being called biosimilars? So I guess the question sounds like it's, why are there two names for this? It has to do with the FDA's pathways. And I think the bottom line is, is when this is new, biosimilars are new, new-ish. And when it started, they didn't know how to categorize biosimilars at all and whether they were, you know, called one thing or another thing. But they wanted to encourage the development of, quote, unquote, generics of biosimilars. And they made a pathway, and they made two different pathways because they couldn't, in my mind, figure out exactly how to do it. But what they didn't want people to do was have to reinvent the wheel. They didn't want them to have to make a new compound, a new follow-on biologic or biosimilar and have to go through all of the, you know, millions of dollars of tests to prove that it was uh, okay to use. So they wanted an abbreviated pathway, but they were trying to figure out how to make an abbreviated pathway. So I think it's just literally the goal was to make a pathway that was simple and got us to the same point of having a biosimilar that in the end can be exchanged with the branded compound and made 
make life easier for our patients, but they didn't define it quite the same way, and there was a bill that was passed, and all these other things happened. But by the time that we've gotten to 2020, I think people realize that these biosimilars are, you know, safely made for the biologics, and we can do it in this pathway that combines it. So honestly, I think it was just figuring out how to get to here, rather than that there's a real difference in any of these products. And it's really about labeling and proving safety, because it's easy to make a chemical compound, but it's hard to make a biosimilar. So I think now we can all be happy and not worry about the differences, but just say these are made safely, they're tested enough, and we can use the data from the parent compound to prove safety and efficacy. Yeah, and you know, it's nice that we have options for patients. Um, so there's actually about three questions that came in very similar here. You know, um, are your patients open to change for reasons other than cost? And uh, is it easy to switch patients to biosimilars or is there a certain resistance? And I'll kind of jump on that one first and then um, I'll, you know, you could weigh in Dr. Peters after that. Uh, but one of the things I can tell you just from my experience, you know, patients, if you spend time with them, and it doesn't mean you have to spend a lot of time, it's just focusing on the education. Knowledge is power, and that knowledge is power to the patient, and not necessarily to us as, as the um, healthcare professionals. But you know, giving the patient the knowledge allows them the power over their diabetes. And working with patients, if they understand the reason, they're usually willing to try something. Now, I'll be honest, I've had patients that are doing very well, and do, if they're you know, doing well, do we really want to make a switch? As long as they're doing well, they can afford the insulin, there's no problems, et cetera. But when it comes to maybe a cost is an issue and that becomes a barrier, or maybe the patient does need some type of a change because maybe they did have a reaction to a different insulin, like my patient who had the swelling lips, and it seemed to be coming from, you know, a different insulin, we switched the insulin, the, you know, swelling went away, and the patient, she did fine. So, you know, I think, again, if there's a reason to make the switch and you educate the patient, they're very reasonable and they'll, they're willing to give it a try. But, again, you have to share the pros and the cons and include them in that decision-making decision um, process. So, Dr. Peters, do you want to add to that? Well, yes. I tell patients, actually, if all insulin were the same cost and the same everything, it would just be, you know, me and the patient deciding. But it's not that way. And the differences with the biosimilars, well, we talked about cost. Some people say they feel better on one insulin than another. And I believe how people feel, mat feel feels matters. So if it's, you know, I can get them one insulin over another, that's fine. Um, for the true allergy, as you discussed, you actually have to fight for the insulin that the patient isn't allergic to. So in some cases, that's a prior auth because there's an allergy to one kind of insulin or another. And then the other thing to consider is the device. So some patients like one device, and there are subtle differences, but if you're giving a shot with a pen every day and you like pen A versus pen B, and I can give it to you, then that's, you know what I mean? It's it's great. So what I want to do is com accommodate patient preferences within the framework of also being cost effective and obviously medically effective. But I think, you know, I really try to do the best I can to help patients get what they're most comfortable with. And I do that, again, within the framework of what I believe is, you know, medically safe substitutions and, and the right insulin for the patient. Yeah, I completely agree, completely agree. And so um, we have time for one more question, and this is more of a statement, but it kind of builds on what we were just talking about here. Uh, are you aware that Walmart sells uh, human regular and NPH insulin for $25 a, a vial? And, uh, again, I'll jump in and start. And, yes, absolutely, uh, the clinic that I work at, we refer a lot of our patients to, to um, Walmart. There are other pharmacies as well that are selling uh, the human insulin, be it R or N, at the $25, but keep in mind this is a vial, so you need syringe, and just very quick story, we had a patient who'd been using a pen for years, very comfortable with it, 
but because, again, for cost purposes, um, the patient needed to switch, we switched to NPH, and we had to teach her how to actually draw up the insulin, because now, again, this goes back to education of a new device, how to properly do this. Unfortunately, this poor patient was in tears because of the complexity of a vial and syringe compared to a pen, and she was very upset about the change in this, but she understood the fact because of the cost. So, um, yes, you know, this is obviously something we send our patients to there a lot. It's kind of putting a bandage on a hemorrhage, uh, you know, but education is so important. So I think it builds to your point of what is the device that the patient is comfortable with as well. We can't just send them there without the education. So um, I know we're almost out of time. So, Dr. Peters, your final comments or thoughts on this. Well, I have to say one thing about the NPH and regular. First of all, I switch people to that as well when it's necessary, but there's a, a PDF uh, set of instructions on the American Diabetes Association website that actually explains how people dose-wise should be switched from analog to non-analog insulin, and it's really helpful because there's stories out there on the Internet that says, you know, my son was switched to the Walmart insulin and he died because it's bad insulin. And the problems have been that people don't know, as you just heard Susan tell you, how to use NPH in regular. So it's not the same as using the analog, and you actually have to figure out the doses. So when people switch from analog to non-analog insulin and vice versa, we need to figure out a new regimen. And I do it all the time. I feel like, you know, I'm proud of the fact that I'm a pro at using any insulin that you know helps a patient and I can do it cost effectively and do the $25 vials but it is a learning process for the patient and an adjustment in terms of how does a non-analog insulin work so go to that website or go to the ADA website and if you need the instructions they're there and it is a set of really good suggestions for how to do the switching yeah excellent points well Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're out of time, and I'd like to thank Dr. Peters for her insightful, uh, knowledgeable information, and uh, hope everybody has a great day, and thank you for attending. <laughs>